engineering degree for us. Ooh, so yeah, I'm happy to, oh, there's lots of questions <laughs> in here. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much, uh, Fiona. It was a wonderful, I mean, it's kind of followed on very nicely from uh, the previous speaker. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been sort of writing some comments about the, the similarities and the themes there. But I'll, I'll open the floor now for questions. We have a few minutes for that. If uh, anybody would like to, to take the mic or uh, put the questions in the chat, please. Thank you. While people are typing, um, you mentioned that you used a, um, a different framework um, for mm -hmm. the strengths. Uh, in, in is it Clifton Strength or is it something different? You mentioned uh, it's called both Clifton and Gallup. I think at one point Gallup took over Clifton. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, okay, yeah. Are there are there any challenges of 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 uh, you know do you find using that? Do do students uh, uh, somehow find that? like why they why they having to fill up a personality type, type form or or are there any other different difficulties that you face so far when using those uh, tools yeah so i uh, guess yeah, student engagement is an issue um you know as i said the students some of our students you know they they've come to to do some some hard maths and some science and and they send, you suddenly go can you take this something that looks like a personality test or could be argued to be a personality test they don't quite see where it where it fits um we also because we work a lot with i work a lot with first year students and i'm sure colleagues will have seen this they come in being very marks focused because obviously that's how you pass your a levels um and so that you know if it's not got marks attached it can occasionally have a bit of a Kind of well why am i doing this um but we also find that students can on occasions they sort of get one of the reasons we went for the clifton strengths rather than belbin is we did find that if students were given a role they sort of assumed that that was their role forever and ever and ever and they could never be anything else mm. for some students and i think possibly particularly those students who are second or third you know um you know english is their second or third language and so understanding the nuance of what we mean by Belbin and, and how it works can be a little bit tricky for them, actually, um, and, and being able to have that conversation. So, um, yeah, there are a few, we, we have found a few kind of issues with it, but overall, we, we found it a little bit more useful for what we wanted it for. Uh, we don't use it for group formation, for example. We use, tend to use random group formation, although we do make sure we've not sort of a, um, left one of our female engineers in a team with kind of nine other men, mm. uh, men. so we do try and make sure that, that we're doing a little bit of that um, mm -hmm. as well. Mm. Okay, no, thank you so much. Um, if there are any further questions, please uh, post them in the in the chat or feel free to take the mic. We have maybe a couple of minutes or maybe any last questions for our second speaker, Fiona? I, uh, if there is any in the chat later on, I'm, I'm sure uh, you know, we'll be happy to. Oh, there is something. Yeah. Could you say a bit more about accessibility issues that you might have faced? Yeah. Um, so one of the accessibility issues we actually have, UCL is nearly 200 years old. Some of our estate wasn't built with wheelchairs in mind, for example. <laughs> You know, um, we're also in one of the issues with being in the middle of London is it's very difficult for us to build new staff. You know, we'd have to sort of start knocking down the British Museum and they don't really like that if you suggest that uh, to them for us to expand. So in terms of accessibility, it is really tricky for, for our uh, students to actually necessarily just even navigate the estate. And that's something we have to, to really be aware of. Um, and we also, we do a lot of work with our virtual learning space. So we use Moodle as our virtual learning space. So we make sure our online content is very accessible. We do stuff like we ensure our um, slides are up or as, as early as we can. 
uh, beforehand. We try and record sessions, although I would say with teamwork, it's very tricky because there's only so much, you know, we sort of have a, a um, you know, we have lots of recordings of rooms full of people talking to each other in teams, which is not necessarily particularly useful um, for our students. And so we are really trying to understand also what would be helpful for our students. Um, you know, we is it useful, um, for example, to have a, an extension on coursework for students? That's one of the ones that we are working with at the moment. But also, how do our students use their extensions with coursework? Um, uh, are they always using the full week because we, a week is a kind of standard extension we have? Is, are they really using one or two days? Um, and how do we ensure that they're not being pressured into to using the full extension by uh, the rest of their team because they've seen that they can get more time? So it, it is really interesting in having those conversations with students about how they have those those discussions. So it is really tricky um, to you know we've got certain issues around kind of um how uh, accessible we can make aspects of it uh, as i said you know we we try and make sure that we're in places that are accessible uh, states wise but it's not always possible um necessarily um and trying to provide students with what they need um in terms of workspace but again we we are resource limited so that can that can kind of become a bit of a tricky um issue so yeah oh, okay thank you so much once again uh, maybe have a round of uh, virtual applause for, for fiona um and uh, we can uh, slowly move on to our next present presenter maybe while we're setting up um, I don't know how ready we are. Let's find out, Kat, how are you doing? Our next presenter, Kat Clark. Hi there. Hi, yes. Uh, you're, you're ready to go or uh, with, with the yes. slides? Yes. Okay, so super, super. I just wondered, um, Manish, do you, I can't share my, can you see, see my slides at the moment? No, not at the minute. Okay, so. I've got them sharing on my screen, but I think it's not going to work. So is there okay. any way I could ask you to share the slides for me, please? Yeah, I do have them, so I can do that. Uh, let me just try that. Uh, hold on. I did download them. So, and if in the meantime, somebody wants to go and grab a cup of coffee or just stretch your legs, feel free to do that while I'm just finding slides there we are hi i'm not sure if you can you hear me manish yet there's an echo coming back uh, from from one of your devices maybe you've got two Um, screen share application. Yeah, that's that should do. If I can find the PowerPoint. Window. Oh, there it is. There it is. Can you see it? Uh, yes, I can see it. And um, Manish is um. My audio is functioning okay now. Yes, yes, perfectly fine. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, and see if you could go to full view. Uh, so you're looking at what the presenter view or not the presenter view? If if you can do it. If not, don't worry. I'm you know don't. Uh, I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I've got two screens here and, and it's gone on. Let me just take the other screen out. It might just fix the problem. It might give me some other problem. <laughs> okay, um, don't worry. I'll, uh, if, if you're happy with this, we can continue with that. I'm fine with that. Uh, okay, be great. Hopefully, people can see the the text uh, easily. Okay. So yeah, I think I'll, we just will. give me the cue whenever whenever you want me to switch on to the next slide. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, I just want to say thanks. Uh, for the invite to speak today.
My name's Kath Caldwell, and I'm an educational developer at Central St. Martins at the University of the Arts. So, and we're going to talk today a little bit more um, openly about compassionate approaches to feedback, and also within the context of the post-pandemic, uh, as Fiona said, many of the themes that, uh, Fiona, you mentioned uh, um, are coming up at my university as well with large numbers of students. But I've got a quick question for everybody. Would you go to slide two, please, Manish? I thought we might have a little bit more of a conversation today, if that's possible. <laughs> it's a bit ambitious, given my, um, my uh, university computer is blocking so many pop-ups. But could you go to slide two, please, Manish? Is it, is it showing not already now? It isn't. Would you, oh. would you give, it, give it another nudge and it will go? Oh, so maybe you there are. Go. Okay, okay you go. so you're you're still looking at the the PowerPoint rather than it's uh, okay. Sorry, okay. yeah. Okay, no problem. So I just want to ask everybody here, and um, uh, you know, please feel free to put your cameras on if you want, or pick up the mic. But given it's the May the fourth, and um, some tough love out there, I just wondered, did every does anybody remember a teacher who was particularly tough on you when you were learning when you were growing up? My my English teacher, I'll give you an example, told me I was a terrible writer. And so for many years, I thought I was a terrible writer. So we use this. What do you think? Would anybody like to put a word in the chat or use an emoji? Thank you, Lucinda. <laughs> I'll just give you a minute to let that flow in. And again, I would encourage everybody to pick up the mic. My 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 presentation is a bit less transmissive, so we've got time. I think everybody's still getting a coffee, Manish. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, I share that sentiment. Listen, I had a teacher like that when I was um, in school. I, and also, I think there's a, a regime. Uh, I'm talking about the art school model, which is quite critical. So the idea of you put your work up, and or you put your let's go to engineering. You put your engineering project up, and the aim of the tutor is to pull you down a little bit. You know, to to dress you down and. Um, in the fashion business, we hear, well, look, it didn't do me any harm. Look at me now, you know. Mm. Stuart, you, would you like to come in and elaborate a little bit more? You don't have to, but maybe give us an example. Or would you rather not talk about it? Um, I Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can, yes. Thank you for coming in. Um, I had a technology teacher that um, I found this was during my GCSEs when I was at school and um, I wasn't very engaged in the class so I was about 15 16 and I was like just messing about with my friends so we didn't really get on and I told him I wasn't very engaged with his teaching I shouldn't have the uh, joys of youth so he kicked yeah. me out of my class and then on GCSE results day, I ended up getting the best result in the class, even though I'd been removed. <laughs> and he okay. kind of said to me at the end, like, oh, just imagine what you could have learned off of me. And then as a plucky 16 year old, I was like, yeah, I probably would have done worse. <laughs> so, yeah, <Wow. laughs> that was my experience of a teacher being tough on me. <laughs> It's quite interesting, though, you remember that quite clearly all these years later. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever forget that. <laughs> mm. um, would anybody else just like to join Stuart and share? Lucinda, tears? Were there tears? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mind sharing. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for coming in. So, so this was a maths teacher, um, and I'm dyslexic, and I reverse numbers. Um, but I didn't. It wasn't really a thing because I'm quite old. It certainly wasn't a thing in the 
the sort of the primary school I attended. Um, and we used to get called up to the front to do calculations um, in front of everybody, much like you've described. Um, and yeah, um, I would, for obvious reasons, um, get it wrong. Um, and you had to do it in a particular way as well, even though other mm -hmm. ways would give yeah. you the right answer. Um, and I don't think really that my my way of thinking aligned with the ways in which the teacher wanted me to produce work. Um, so even when I got the right answer, I was told that I was wrong. Um, and much like you with your writing, for many, many yeah. years, I thought I couldn't do maths and I avoided it. Um, turns out it's not true. Having <laughs> turns out it's not true, I know. Yeah, yeah. Having, having since come back to um, doing a, a variety of things with um, mathematical concepts. Um, turns out I love it. Who knew? Um, Who but knew? It, it took a very long time. Um, I, think, I think what you're talking about is taking a long time to recover from that. And um, you're absolutely right. Manish, would you just go on to slide three for me, please? Um, thank you. Which is, you know, I still think about that now. I just published my third textbook and I think, oh, Mr. Williams, if you could see me, you know, I can write, but it, it just took me a long time. Um, let's go on to slide four since we've we've covered this material. So just to think about how this applies to teaching and learning, we've introduced some interventions into feedback approaches and we've deliberately gone for a compassionate feedback approach. And um, we've tried to remove that studio culture of dressing people down, um, thinking that tough love will ultimately peel somebody apart and build them up in a new um, model because partly we've realized and we've searched and searched and we can't find any research that says that being cruel to students helps their cognitive ability <laughs> it definitely doesn't help you remember things um, we have 35 percent of many of, of our courses have disabled and um, dyslexic students uh, who declare their disability and their specific learning differences. So we've got quite a large population. So now these haven't, this hasn't always landed well, but uh, our, so what we did was we, we used writing feedback workshops where we talked to staff about their, we actually critically looked at their feedback text. We also introduced resources, which I'll share the links with. Um, this is a compassionate feedback glossary uh, and a handout. And we also did assessment mapping for courses where we are tied together the, and made sure that the learning was scaffolded. So that one of the main things is not being really tough on level four students when they've just arrived. Again, really interesting about the engineering students in their first year. You know, you can't treat them as third year students, but many staff are. So moving on to slide five is um, a quote for you about what we our definition of what is compassionate feedback it doesn't mean it's being really nice and kind all the time it's about being more detailed it's about being precise and using less tentative wording like perhaps maybe um, and using english colloquialisms like if you wouldn't mind or uh, do you think it would be good if you did such a thing? Those things don't translate because we have 48% of our students are international and they do confuse people with neurodiversities. We have to remind staff on the fourth bullet point that giving feedback is not about the tutor saying, I would have preferred you did this because I believe in X, you know? and also about judging the work not evaluating the performance so uh lucinda you know not not actually caring how you got to the end result or the process but actually say did you meet the learning outcomes fine you know and not judging the way you did it and we did notice when we looked at feedback samples on the last bullet point that 
um, we were not giving the same amount of feedback, the same length of feedback to students who were getting lower grades than we were to the higher grades. There was more to say about the higher grades, and, but they, so they got more feed forward. Um, could we have the next slide, Manish? Thank you. So I'll give you, this one is an example of having done some of those workshops with the staff and having used the compassionate feedback prompts, the language of the forms and the built-in systems to our assessment, kind of the structure of assessment started to change. So the reflective tutorial form in uh, first year used to say something like, tell us what you did, <laughs> um, what are you going to do next? Give us four bullet points. So uh, one of my colleagues who very kindly said I could share this example started using affirmations within the tutorial form. This is in a cohort of 200. So again, referring back to the point we made earlier about how on earth do you make an impression on a, a large cohort, but kind language can definitely help. So you can see, um, I'm not sure about that first statement, you're amazing, we really mean it. Uh, this, I didn't write this, so I'm kind of reflecting, um, is that too much? I'm not sure. That might feel uncomfortable to you, but to this stage leader, this year leader, she felt this was appropriate. But you can see the words, uh, what positive changes can you identify in the way you are working? Um, feeling equipped to deal with future design challenges. What practical skill sets are you taking forward? So this is affirmative language. It's not corrective and it's not criteria based, it's affirmative. So what, what happens is the students open up their reflections and give more, um, more of themselves. I'm just gonna stop here and see, would anybody like to comment on this? I think this might be appropriate in your university or have you, do you also use compassion in your um, in your in your digital forms? Because what one of the things I'm trying to do is get this in when we move on to digital forms and uploading things to Moodle, submitting PDFs, and putting things into Turnitin. We kind of use some much more mechanical language. So, uh, does anybody have any thoughts on that? I'll stop speaking for a minute. You can pop something in the chat, or you can pop the mic. Um, I have a question just to, to understand it a little bit better. So these uh, questions, the three bullet points on the slide, is that part? Yep. Of, is that part of the feedback, or is that the form? I, I, I sorry, I didn't. No, this is as a, apologies. This is a tutorial form. Mm -hmm. So this is asking the students to okay, to yeah. give, yeah, give, give, give more up. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but it's it's a soft. You can see it's quite a soft approach. Mm, mm. No, I think with, with compassion, I think I, I do want to start using in that. And um, I will talk a bit more in my own, own presentation about it as well. OK. But, but yeah, I'll yeah. let other people take the floor. Yeah, Lucinda, you, you, you might have to build it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I found in, in terms of you just mentioned they like it when you put smiley faces in, you know, I used to hate putting smiley faces in and emojis when my I was I reacted with horror, but I realised that they translate internationally across languages and they are emotional, obviously emo, emotional emot emoticons. So yeah, but this is the beginning. We're, what we're trying to do also here in this particular stage is build up retention. Um, this course has an extremely high level of retention. So we're hoping if this, these kinds of approaches work, we might uh, put that onto our courses that have low retention. And I'll give you some results in a minute. Thank you for that comment. Um, Manish, let's go on to the next slide, please, slide seven. So having, having used um, the feedback workshops, I just want to let you know what the external examiners said um, after the feedback workshops were implemented and the staff were giving kinder feedback as well. Um, the external examiners said that it was much more detailed and tailored to individual submission, um, outlined strengths of weaknesses, 
and much more closely to the learning outcomes and assessment criteria. This was fine art, so it's a lot less based on the subjective views of the tutor. Um, the, the clarity of the feedback was commented on um, and how submissions. So we were pleased that that happened. And I, I know what you're probably thinking for those of you in law and engineering, et cetera, and I've got a lawyer and an engineer's son myself, you know, you're thinking maybe we need more precision, maybe we need more corrective feedback, but we are also giving that as well. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, we have another, um, so the, what did the course leaders say about the, the results of this? And the course leader said, for the first time students said they understood their feedback, fewer of them sought help in interpreting what they needed to do next. That's a paraphrase. Um, so particularly the international students who needed translations on, um, on, on, the, on the nuances or the language. So the course leader was delighted because she saved a lot. This, this is a different department over in Camberwell. Uh, different, it, I think it was a sculpture department. They didn't waste, if you like, so much time going over the feedback. Next slide, please. So just on some of the stats, I'm um, very keen on understanding what's happening with inclusion and with disability. So again, using more compassionate feedback and introducing better feed forward into all of the structures, we found the most group, the group that mostly benefited were students with disabilities and um, specific learning disorders. So you can see in 2021, they, their attainment was at 79%, and in one year it moved up to 88%. Um, um, which there were very few other factors. Actually, there was one other factor going on at that time, which is we also introduced a decolonizing the curriculum um, intervention as well. But again, this is in fine art, and this is where there were 35% of the students declaring disabilities. In the green text, um, these are specific learning disabilities now. So this is dyslexia, dyspraxia. Um, I can't remember the other one. They they also went up from 76% to 88%. So there's another uh, stat which is which was which was helpful. Please go on to the next slide. Thank you, Anish. So um, there's a lot more to say on this but I can see time ticking. And I wondered if um, there was one thing that we could do to be more human and compassionate. We haven't really talked a lot today about AI and the implications of this, but I'm really hoping that the compassionate um, methodology is, is not um, so well done by machines as, as it is done by humans. Because those of you who've been to the chat GPT sessions will know that often um, often the, the voice of the computer is quite bland. And people have said, not, not me, I don't have this evidence, but they have said it's kind of like a white male, able-bodied voice. So I'm hoping that our human and compassionate tra traits might actually help us to survive in this world of AI. Manish, what do you think? You've put an AI and a smiley in. Would you? Yes, I, I think the reason it's bland is because they want to play it safe and they don't want to try. put a specific spin on it. But I think with prompt engineering, you could make the same AI, which is bland on the one hand, I mean, to, to, to turn around to be a bit more emotive, a bit more um, careful and compassionate, as you're saying. And mm. uh, I think what would be nice to to is to hear from yourself in in this occasion would be to, to to maybe just filter out what other things are you telling staff to do? What are the key things? And if you told those exact same things to this language model, I'm quite confident that it'll come up with something uh, that you know possibly a human would would come up with as a result of you explaining mm -hmm. to them what you want uh, the feedback to look like. 
that's what okay. I did. Well, yeah. That's interesting. So um, let's just see. So if, if I was to program the AI, I'm just going back to my slides on my other screen, oh, in the, onto the prompts. So if we went to slide five, num it, yeah. So what you're saying is if we if we if we advise uh, AI to put these in, put these things in, yes, that might help. Yes, I think yeah. <laughs> so if we say be precise and avoid tentative wording or colloquialism, whatever, yeah. then it will do that because it's just, it's like a machine. It's uh, it takes input in natural language and puts out natural language. And uh, yeah. if you give it the right parameters, it will try and obey you. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what we hope to do is, of course, like everybody else, help use AI to take away some of the labor, hard labor, and then give ourselves, buy ourselves a little bit of time back, even for face-to-face -face, uh, conversations and um, negotiation and alliance forming with our students you know the 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 time that we feel is taken away by filling in forms for 200 students um that's not as many as fiona mentioned but let's just th yeah thanks for that manish is there so can we go back to slide 10 please yeah and then just to 11, please. So I just want to say thanks for that. Um, I've, I've used this illustration, which is the University of Then and the University of Now. Um, you know, I have a think about that later. This is this sort of stereotypes now that the universities are full of activists. Um, what did he say? That he's on FaceTime, they're full of anxiety and they're remote. Um, whereas some of the, the tutors who learned to do some of that tough feedback were part of a past university that perhaps doesn't exist anymore, which was um, really did privilege some of the uh, some of the more um, gifted people. Um, if you go to slide twelve for me, please, I'll, I'll send these references over and also the links because we'll be able to share the slides won't we Manish yeah okay so can we can we stop sharing slides now and just perhaps just have a conversation if anybody else can do that and I think we're just about at time yes don't uh, don't worry about the stopping slide sharing I, I can't uh, at the moment but yeah feel feel free to okay. ask questions uh, via chat or by by microphone if anybody we can uh, we have a few seconds few more seconds okay we do have um also we have reduced awarding gaps in the black and minority ethnic areas using this method but I've published that elsewhere, so I'd, I wanted just to keep this to kind of almost a vocabulary, mm. just to make that point today. No, very important point, and especially with the AI tools around, I think that, that there is something definitely to be done uh, in, in that area. Um, and, and I tried doing something um, within my coursework, so I'm, I'm kind of teaching into my own content later on, but yeah, I'll, I'll save that for later. But um, Anybody else have any further questions for Kath? Hi, Kath. That was really interesting. I really like the idea of compassionate feedback. Um, obviously, you touched yeah. upon having a lawyer and an engineer in your family. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just thinking, I think with like the art school because i work across the university this would be easier to get buy-in what would your suggestions be in terms of getting buy-in from like the law school for example or the engineers and stuff like that okay well the, the most the first thing to say is that when a student is under any kind of unnecessary anxiety or stress uh, the brain shuts down you know the 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 short-term memory and the hard-term memory tend to uh, freeze. It's one of the reactions. And if 
a student has any other lived experience um, of having been told off before as a child, um, it, it can be triggering. So, for instance, uh, I mentioned about being told I was a rubbish writer. If I ever get comments about writing that are perhaps not very kind, I would immediately think, oh, that's because I'm a terrible writer. So that's one thing. It's it's being very mindful that you have intersectional needs um, across. You don't know whether your international student is dyslexic or whether they have a, dis a hidden disability. That's one thing. Um, I just had another point there. The other point was about um, performativity as well. Uh, we are making sure to be fair in our marking around, unless we ask a student to present well. So, for example, in a legal context, if you're, do you mark students on how they present, how they speak, uh, or are you marking them on their text and their written abilities just to clarify what you're giving them feedback on um, also that's what I was going to say we're looking at trauma-informed pedagogy now and non-violent communication trauma-informed pedagogy we've noticed as you have that the students coming out of the pandemic don't have the same behaviors and skills that other students have and that does come to law and engineering as well so I think being kind and compassionate can help those who've perhaps been through bereavement or um, that terrible lockdown that they were in, which affected their lives much more than ours. So I'll stop there. Does that answer your question, Stuart? Yeah, that was great, Kath. Thanks. That's really, yeah, I'm going to use some of that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, what we can partly do is I can share some of the materials afterwards um, with you particularly that would be pertinent to that yeah that'd be great thanks Kath. you're welcome okay so maybe we can uh, bring this one uh, this session also to uh, this part of the presentation to close thank you very much uh, kath and a virtual round of applause uh, please remember to put some comments about all of the sessions that you've attended towards the end of the session if you can we can now uh, invite uh, Joel Mills from uh, BPP. Uh, Joel, can you hear me? Uh, you have the ability to upload your presentation. You know how to do that. So you need me guiding yeah, you. I'm going to share the application or screen, but it's not seeming to, to do it. So. Okay, let me see. Let me see if I have. Uh, yeah, you are on the presenter list. So do you see the sign saying share content? Yeah. Okay, if you click that, then there's either an application share or a file share, and nothing happens, you're saying, when you click that? I'm clicking on sharing both window or entire screen, but uh, I can't see that coming up there for everybody. Okay. Ooh, that's a bit of a new one for me. I Usually it works. Um, I, I don't know if you want to email me your presentations. I can I, do I the same. Done, yeah. You have done. Okay, yeah. let me just quickly go in. Yes, another opportunity for leg stretching if people want to. Uh, yes, I can see your email now. So I'll just download your... I'm also... As well. Ooh, your audio is splitting up. Okay, so let me try this time to do a proper um, screen share rather than um, how do I do that? Entire screen. There we go. I'm up. I'm up and running. There we go. I've oh, you're up and running. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. I'll, I won't do anything then. Okay. Over to you. Please uh, tell us a bit about your yourself, your work, and use your thirty minutes for the talk and and the Q and A. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about um, our use of and testing of the Turnitin AI tool um, at BPP. Uh, I'm Associate Professor Joel Mills. I'm Head of Learning and Teaching at BPP University. We're a privately funded university um, and we have a number of different arms to our, um, to our products. Um, we also have professional qualifications that we deliver and also work for clients as well. 
um, delivering specific and bespoke training for them. Uh, we have a dedicated university, which is a separate entity in its own right. Um, and this is where our AI tool sits. Um, as, as you know, uh, we, we put content through uh, Turnitin to detect for similarity and originality. Um, and recently Turnitin have introduced a new tool, which some universities have opted into, majority have opted out of at the moment. So that's the kind of current landscape. My background of research at the moment is around the use of AI in education, um, specifically around assessment, but more widely in terms of its benefits to staff as well as students. And uh, we'll, we'll cover some of that content as well. But, uh, I've been experimenting very heavily <laughs> in the last few months, of course, with the rise and rise of AI, ChatGPT, Bard, Bing, you know, we can name a million and one other AI tools that are out there right now. And every day this landscape seems to change. So without further ado, um, this is uh, this is GPT-4. This is what we know as, as AI. And what is AI good for? Well, we all know what AI can do. Um, AI can, you know, write prompt, based on prompts that we put in. It can write content for us. It can develop um, narratives. It can solve problems. It can write code. It can even now generate images, video, audio. There's a whole range of things that have exploded onto the scene right now. Um, for example, this very simple prompt in GPT-4, Old MacDonald had a farm. Um, ChatGPT will complete that entire um, children's um, story for you and children's song for you with all the verses and just write it out just from a few simple words. It knows what to expect to come afterwards um, once you put that basic prompt in. Um, so why is this a threat and what's what's the interest here around AI and Turnitin? Well, the fear is that students will use AI to cheat. That's the fear that we've got. Um, and an example here would be um, we set an essay question such as a very simple one like this, which is what I've used to train AI on. Um, and OpenAI will then write that essay for you. It will even try and provide you with references. It'll even try and write them in the Harvard citation format. So the fear here is that students are submitting or are going to use it to submit and write essays for us. Um, now, the concern here is obviously, as, as, as part of uh, being an academic, is understanding that we are trying to assess the students' work, trying to assess the students' thinking, and understand that, that they have a, a level of comprehension of the tasks that have been set for them based on the learning that they've done so far. So how does this fit in with um, what's actually happening? Well, students um, can complete essays and, and turn it in, can attempt to um, interpret those essays based on um, a number of algorithms that it uses to detect AI. But students are using AI to cheat, so how will we know whether they're using AI to cheat? Well, as in per, per, per the Turnitin model, you can take a student submission and put it through a number of different detectors tools. Before Turnitin came on the market um, in, in April, there were only a few a handful of, of tools which we could use to detect um, AI writing. So taking the output of, of a simple essay question like this, I put this essay result from GPT, um, which is the AI engine generator. Um, and I put that through a number of different tools, a couple of different tools in fact. So the first tool I put the resulting essay through was GPT-0. Now GPT-0 is produced by the same people as ChatGPT. It's OpenAI. Um, not only have they created an engine, a large language model which generates content, um, they've also created a detection tool which reverses the algorithm to detect whether content has been written by AI. And it uses a combination of measures which output as a, what's called a perplexity score, how complex the language used in, uh, in the inputted data, and a burstiness score, which is the, the kind of humanness of the score. Uh, and the higher the score, the more likely it is written by um, AI. So the results here were very, very interesting. Taking uh, the, the, this essay result from the, the essay we see in front of us and putting it through GPT-0, of course, OpenAI was in, uh, able to detect its own output. Of course it was, it's the same company, they just reversed the algorithm and it detected it as entirely AI generated with, the, with those particular scores. 
However, I wrote exactly the same essay question and fed it into Bing Chat. Now, Bing Chat is based on GPT-4. Um, you don't have to pay for it. Anyone can use it. Um, whereas at the moment, the OpenAI model is a paid for subscription model. But in inputting that question to Bing Chat, I took the resulting output, um, put it through GPT-0, and GPT-0 thought it was entirely human written. So very low perplexity score, very low burstiness score. It thought it was very, very likely to have been written entirely by a human. Yet it was exactly the same essay question and used the same engine to generate the results for that question. So that started to cause me kind of alarm bells ringing and thinking, OK, well, there's something going on here. There's, there's, it's not kind of detecting this and, and maybe we should think about this in terms of assessment and how we're going to um, manage this. I knew the Turnitin tool was coming at this point, but we haven't got access to it. So um, I, was, I was watching with bated breath to see how this would work in Turnitin. Um, I took the, uh, the same output and put it through a different uh, GPT detector. And this one was called smodin.io. And once again, I got similar results. So I've got a, I've got a, um, uh, a control model with GPT and GPT-0, and I put it through a different detection um, agency and got similar results. So again, a 94.9% uh, likelihood of being completed by AI, but Smodin thought the Bing AI was a 0% likelihood of being complete AI content. So this is the scene. We've got students potentially using OpenAI to um, create essays, writing references, and putting structure and content together, putting argument together. And at this point in time, which is about March, uh, March this year, the current GPT detectors were giving me mixed results. On the one hand, it could detect AI if you used match for match model, but if you used a different engine to generate the content, it was coming out as entirely human. So that was the landscape we, we started with. So then introduced Turnitin. Um, on April the 4th, uh, Turnitin introduced um, a new tool to all institutions that was put directly into um, live Turnitin production um, environment. We had no option at this point to run it in a beta environment, in a testing platform or a test account. So institutions had to either decide to opt in and have the tool, in which case it would be visible to everybody, or opt out, in which case you wouldn't have access to the tool and you wouldn't be able to test it. Um, as far as I know from my discussions with Turnitin, um, this is going to continue until January 2023, um, when the AI tool will move across from the existing uh, place that it resides, which is within the similarity tool checking service. And it will move into their originality tool, which checks for um, contract cheating, um, and, and other such uh, um, devices. So if you want to get the AI tool from January onwards, you'll have to pay for and buy into their contract cheating tool called Originality, and the AI tool will sit there. So we've got this period, this window now, between having it turned on, we made the decision to turn it on on 4th of April, and so we got access to the tool, and it's enabled us to run tests between now and January on the confidence levels we have in Turnitin's ability to detect AI writing. So AI came about, we've got, this, um, we've got this tool available to us, and what was really interesting was the results when we started feeding in some of our essays into the Turnitin AI tool to provide comparisons with our control samples in the other open AI detection uh, models. So at this time, we decided to produce this statement, which I'll come back to in a moment. We drafted as an institution a decision on how we were going to use AI and allow students to use AI within their assignments. So our position at BPP currently um, is that students can use AI to support their learning. Um, they can consult with it. They can use it to draft frameworks and structures to their assignments, um, which they would then need to revise and submit um, with significant revision to be their own work. We're not saying that we're saying initially that students were not permitted to present the output of generative AI as their own work for summative assessment. So there has to be um, a rewriting on the student's behalf um, with the understanding that we would then be able to see whether Turnitin could detect the AI generated content um, and 
put this into uh, Turnitin and then identify potential academic malpractice. So this is the statement that's interesting at the bottom. Students suspected of using substantive generative AI in their submission, submissions without proper attribution on the source of their work, which is another moot point, will be referred for academic misconduct. Now, this to me does not fit in with um, the JEDI uh, model particularly well, because we are applying punitive measures to something where we have not necessarily yet got the expertise or even ability within the tools to successfully detect AI. My suspicions were already aroused through my previous testing, but the academic quality unit wanted to make sure and wanted to come back down very strongly and saying, we don't want students just submitting AI in their submissions and passing their modules with content that they haven't actually written. And again, you can begin to imagine the headlines that if, um, if it got out and the, the Daily Sun decided to, uh, to get their teeth into some freedom of information requests on the number of students who had AI detected but weren't penalised, they'd have a field day with that, with a headline. You can just see it the next day, which says um, such and such university allows students to cheat in their, their assignments by using AI to generate all their content. So this was this was concerning to us. Um, so this idea that we can actually detect it needed very rigorous testing before we could actually apply this. So this statement was written, hasn't been released yet, because the landscape of AI is moving so fast, things are changing on a daily basis, as we, we will see. So enter Turnitin into the market. And we took these essays and we put these, these essays into uh, Turnitin. And again, the essay questions were very simple. We saw the first one before. You'll act as a news reporter, provide me with a short essay on the politics of the moon landings. I took my essays from the previous samples and I put them through Turnitin. And I've got the dates here, I put them through. So it's quite soon after the, uh, the Turnitin uh, tool was released on April the 4th. And we can see here, we've got the first essay, which is straight copy and paste from GPT-4. And in the slides, you can actually click on that link and it will take you to um, the, uh, the source of that essay. So you can see how that essay was prompted and, and the output of that essay. So the straight output of GPT-4 was detected by Turnitin as 100% AI. Great, it's working, fantastic, happy with that. So it's detected chat GPT-4. Interestingly, um, it took the output from Bing AI chat. Uh, unfortunately, at the time of writing, you, you can't get Bing history, so I can't share the history of, of my Bing chat with you, although that's just been released. I told you it's changing fast. Bing have now introduced chat history into Bing um, as of today. But um, I took the Bing output and put it through Turnitin, 100% AI. Great, this is working. Lot, you know, my confidence is rising here. However, we've got to think about the other tools that are available to, to students as well. So taking the output of ChatGPT4, the same output as, as SA1, but putting it through a tool called Quillbot. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Quillbot, but Quillbot allows you to paste content into its engine and it will paraphrase it. And you can go on paraphrasing it and rewording it to your heart's content and you're happy with the output. You can then download the, the output and use that as your submission. And on the free version of the web browser, and I had to do this paragraph by paragraph rather than the whole thing because of the limits of the, the free version, the outputted essay came back as a 0% Turnitin score. Yet we know that that essay was 100% AI generated. So this was really concerning and of significant interest to Turnitin, who then contacted me when I explained to them on my monthly call with, with my Turnitin agent, saying that you know, we had no confidence in the AI tool at this point. Um, I ended up having conversations with Turnitin engineers, their product team, their developers of the new paraphrasing detection tool that they're building. I've had these conversations and they're very interested in, in these results. So they're, very, they're listening and they're working very hard to try and improve their tool. I then repeated the same um, essay submissions on a different, assi on a different um, assignment tool um, in Turnitin. Um, so I submitted exactly the same three essays and I got exactly the same three results. So at least Turnitin is interpreting it the same. and I'm getting consistency of results from Turnitin, even if they're wrong, I am getting consistency. 
So again, as a control model, that's quite helpful to, to understand the position. I then repeated this with a separate essay, which is um, you'll act as a business analyst um, and it's looking at the business strategy. So this was my prompt to GPT and to Bing. And again, I've got very different results. Again, same structure. We've got GPT-4 at the top with a 67% Turnitin AI score. Bing this time only resulted in 8% Turnitin AI score. But this time it detected the Quillbot version as 100% AI. And yet when I put the Bing output um, through the Quillbot, this time, sorry, the original output again, but this time with a different fluency setting in Quillbot, I got a 48% result. So with a little bit of manipulation, we seem to be able to deceive Turnitin quite considerably. Um, and in this case, um, in uh, Samsung 2, which was the output straight from Bing, it only detected an 8% Turnitin match. So this caused me to then revise our statement out to staff and to students. And our current position is this. We're talking about a confidence position to our senior management team and to students. Um, and the confidence position at the moment is we have no confidence in the tool to detect AI. So at the moment, we are taking this stance, which is that um, the AI score is not to be taken into consideration in any of our marking until such time as we have further confidence in the tool and significant reduction in the false positives that are being generated. So it's very interesting from our point of view because our tests are showing at the moment that detecting AI is ultimately going to penalize students, which provides an unfair um, assessment of their work. And again, in discussion with people in the sector, through Twitter, through my social media networks, through other webinars I've attended, and just following the general AI discussion in higher education, it seems to me that the sector is heading towards an embracing of AI to support the students' learning, and perhaps starting to maybe assess um, a default standard essay, which students then um, improve on. So for example, if we feed our essay questions into, Turnit into GPT, take the resulting essay, and then give that to students as a basis to improve on or critique or identify where there are flaws, that might be a way forwards to use the AI more effectively and embrace it and embed it into the, um, into the assessment process. Or potentially we have the opportunity for students to prompt these um, AI models and we start assessing their prompts rather than necessarily their output. So how can the students, if we're training students to work in the next generation of um, business people um, and, and practitioners, then perhaps we need to train them in how to do prompting. And part of that is the assessment and how well they can use AI to generate something and then fact check it and take a, a reality check on the output of that. And what we should be assessing is their skill in using the AI, not necessarily in, in, in the content it's producing so much. So there are lots of unanswered questions here, and it's a very, very fluid landscape at the moment. But at BPP, what we're trying to do is look at all the options, not take such a hard line stance on just blanket no approach, and understand better what the tools can do for the student, as well as perhaps um, detect where we might need to go, well, actually, this bit's written by AI and, and take maybe a, a cross match. One of the things I've suggested to turn it in is that actually we provide threshold settings. So maybe in future we'll see a, um, a version of Turnitin which allows a certain amount of AI to come through the, the detection tools, along with originality detection, a bit like how we have already um, the ability to create small word matches or large word matches or include the bibliography or don't include the bibliography. My suggestion to Turnitin was that perhaps we combine this into a set of sliders of a threshold that an institution can set and say, actually, we'll allow 10% of our essays content to contain AI generated content, because we realize that that is a tool that is being used to help students craft their work. So rather than taking this blanket, if you've used AI, it's a no, we're trying to embrace AI and work with that. But it, as I say, it's a very, very fluid position and not one that is easy to nail down. So 
that's my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions on that, um, but I just wanted to kind of show you what we're doing. And I'll be very interested to hear from other people who have um, maybe got access to Turnitin and are um, using it already, and perhaps, want, or maybe people have got questions on uh, how how it's detecting the AI, anything like that. But thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you, thank you so much, Joel. Um, yes, uh, any questions for Joel? Uh, fantastic presentation, very good comparison shown. And, and, and you know, when AI chat GPT came along, uh, people were saying either yes or no for it, or and, and now this AI tool, which is uh, detecting AI, again, uh, it's interesting to see how you you know you found that uh, uh, it it can be a, a, an issue with the, within the JD in the JLife framework, and and that's that's an important message. I think we should, we're really grateful for your for your contribution. So over to people uh, if uh, they have any questions, uh, either in chat or to the mic. Yes, I think that's a very good point. Um, it's we, in, in order for assessment to be fair and transparent, I think it benefits both sides, the staff, the institution, the staff and the students, um, if we understand where we're coming from and, and a degree of acceptance that this is out there. We're never going to put the lid back on this box. AI is out there and we will see more and more um, different la um, LLMs, large language models emerging. Um, we've already seen, for example, a law LLM um, emerge onto the market. There's been adverts on Facebook for it and things where you can consult with it from a legal capacity and it's a dedicated LLM that's trained on legal matters. So how much longer before we're going to get, for example, an education LLM, which will help us with assessment and drafting and tr training students to write better um, academically, for example. But these are springing up all over the place. And at the moment, the whole AI market is completely unregulated. And that is the concern. We haven't even touched on data privacy issues or ethics around using AI and where our data goes, how it's stored. Um, but, you know, it does. I think it's going to head towards regulation is my feeling of some kind. But we're never going to not have AI. That's the thing we have to be aware of. It, it's, it's not a case of, well, we, we don't want to do this. It's a case of it's here. So how do we work with it rather than just try and close our eyes and bury our heads in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist? Can, can I just come in there? Please, please. Uh, just to, hang on, sorry, there's a terrible echo on my voice here. Um, I hope you're not hearing that. Um, just to say that the, the what worries me is the uh, attitude that students will cheat. And it, we're slipping right back to the deficit model, aren't we? When we must remember that every student who joins a university course wants to do well and wants to do their own um, work. And sometimes the reasons why they do get extra help or, or uh, use non-standard methods are because of the pressure that they are put upon them, sometimes by their families or by the industries, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think the idea of the universities allowing, say, 20% of content to be AI generated is, is great. But what what you talked about, Joel, about uh, asking students to generate 200 words on a topic and then critiquing it, I think would be fantastic. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's an idea that's been mooted around the sector, so I'm not alone in that thinking. And um, we, we, we're yet to test that. We, we're yet to put that into practice, of course. People yeah. are generally quite resistant to change and, and a bit cautious, maybe even fearful about, you know, going down that route. But um, it, it's only going to take a few handfuls of people across the sector to go, these are the results I've got from doing this. And this is working for us that, that will start to change hearts and minds on this. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a, but in, in this open area, we're going to have to have some trust, aren't we? And some, yes. some ethical... Um, the uh, early signs of an ethical stance really that you know we we will assume you will not use AI but you see one of the things is that 
it's, it's all about the questions that we ask the students, isn't it? Because that we we're often asking for personal identity to be put in the work or environmental solutions or um, uh, again I'm coming from an art and design background there's there's a lot of uh, performance based courses etc so AI does struggle with those things <laughs> and um, we might we might be on a winner there the creative industries might might actually be able to help. Okay, I'll yeah, stop. <laughs> I mean, very interesting on that point because um, my background, my first degree was in graphic design and I taught design for a number of years um, before I went into education management. But um, we're already seeing um, students, for example, photography students um, who could use Mid Journey to create photographs. Um, and they haven't taken a photograph, they've prompted an AI to generate a photograph. So the skill then becomes a bit like the transition from um, traditional photography to digital photography and the, the, in, uh, the involvement of Photoshop. Um, we started then to move towards the assessing the skills of the, the photography students in their use of Photoshop or Adobe Lightroom in improving and enhancing images or making new images or creating digital artwork, which couldn't possibly exist in the real world because it's been mashed together digitally. So we'll perhaps see a transition in the arts world where the skills we start to assess are in your ability to prompt mid-journey to generate the images that you want. Um, because interestingly, we're, we're going to, we're already seeing marketing companies and advertising companies using generative AI images for their material um, because it, it's cheaper, because they can generate them on scale, they can generate them on demand. Um, so, you know, the skill, the, the, the commercial outlet for the photographer another string to their bow is going to have to be generating AI content. Yeah. And I actually, I think that the worldwide audiences of our student body could be really helpful here in that members of our populate, some of our populations are ahead of the curve than the, than the Europeans perhaps. Mm. And I've, I've got, so there's fashion generation going on, fashion collections. There's a lot of um, mimicry and fakery going on, but you know, if they could be used in a positive way so yeah we could work uh with you on some of this if you're interested in in imagining how this could work and imagining scenarios yeah certainly thanks yeah i think i um want to add something here because when you mentioned something about uh, making students uh, use the i while the i while assessment is going on and i think you, you were saying and, and that triggered a chain of thought in my head in my slides, I've talked about using ChatGPT uh, as a learning tool for students. And uh, uh, basically, I capture those interactions using my system. And uh, and, and basically, you, you can see how the students are using it. And if that, if you're assessing those interactions, uh, you're, you're assessing how their skills are around creating those prompts, you are looking at a different set of skills, which will be useful, by the way, in the future workplace, because AI will always be around, um, you know, us in, in our workplaces. It is currently available for me to, I don't know, if, if I did a systematic review and I wanted to put an abstract into the uh, AI tool, and it can it can do a PICO analysis for me very quickly and very accurately most of the time. Um, so AI will be around for people to use in their workplace. So why don't we then start assessing on the skills that are needed to use the AI as you were suggesting? So I think that there is there is something there. But uh, yeah, keeping uh, to the focus, I think I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer any other questions that are there in the chat if, if they're relevant. Well, I think we've got no more questions in the chat. Okay, so there was a comment from Alex. I'm just reading it through. Yeah, okay. Super duper. Uh, how are people feeling to continue? I, I've got my slides to, to go through. Uh, if if people are f wanting to, you know, sit another 20 minutes, I can I can I can do that. Otherwise, I can also do it on another Thursday. Uh, I'll take your cue on that pretty much because it's been two hours. So I'm conscious that Thank people... you very much. I, I do have to leave. Um, I've got school runs and things to do. But uh, sure, sure. Thank you. I'll, I'll Thank, you. Thank you so much. Present. Thank you so Finish. much for your lovely presentation much appreciated okay so if people are leaving that's fine please do complete the the survey um and uh, 
depending upon how many are left, we can we can take a call on whether should I continue with my slides or I can do it another time. I'm quite happy to do it either way. Uh, Manish, when is, when is the next uh, session of this where we can pick some of these things up again? Did, did I see something in June about inclusivity? No, we we do every um, last Thursday is a definite for us. Um, okay. Apart from the summer months, uh, sometimes we we can't do it because all of us are busy and all. But every yeah. uh, Thursday, last Thursday of month, but uh, so there will be one this month, and it is uh, around that topic. Um, but we, when we have more speakers, uh, when we have more people to, to share their work, we can trigger an extra session on any of the Thursdays, basically, okay. uh, at 12 to 1. Does that answer your query? Or you, you, yes, you that does. Yes, yes, because okay. we're over time and I'm afraid I'm going to have to go as well. Yes. But I wanted yes. to see your totally slides. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm quite more than happy to email them to you to, to show you before. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. And it's been a pleasure to join in today. Just thank you so everybody. much for coming. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot for sharing okay. your your